Good afternoon and welcome to Lift and Rift Ministries. My name is Patrick Bostito. I want to apologize again for this morning. Had some technical difficulties. The volume wasn't working. I believe I got it all worked out and sorted out. So we're going to jump into our Bible study today. Um, we're finishing or we're continuing in John chapter 8. And we're going to look at verses uh, 39 through 47. And we want to talk about who is your father. And Jesus in this portion of scripture talks about two different fathers that we have either God the Father or Satan, who is would be the other father. If you have your Bibles, get them out, turn them to John chapter 8, uh, starting in verse uh, 39, and we're going to jump in. Let's pray and get started. Heavenly Father, we come to you this afternoon, Lord. We're thankful for the uh, time that we have together, the ability to come, the technology that's available to us, Lord, and uh, just your blessing in this, Lord. We ask that you meet with us here today, Lord. Help us to pull things out of this scripture that you would have for us to uh, apply to our lives, to make a better name on this earth for you, Lord, to spread your name, to spread your gospel. Lord, help us to uh, speak boldly for you, Lord. Help me to speak boldly and bring back to remembrance the things that I've studied, Lord. Help me to hide behind the cross, Lord, that they can only see you, not me. If anyone watching this video does not know you as their Lord and Savior, I pray today is the day that they come to you, that true salvation by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast, as your word says. Help us to understand that, Lord. Help us to uh, pay attention, be attentive, open hearts, listening ears to see what you have for us today. We thank you for what you've done, what you're doing, and what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, we're in John chapter 8 this morning, or this afternoon, John chapter 8, and we're going to begin reading in verse um, 39. We're, we're going to begin in 38, and we're going to go through 47. Verse 38 says, I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But no, now ye seek, seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they unto him, we be born, not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus saith unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot, cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth in me, or convinceth me of sin? And I, if, if, if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. So we see there, we see um, some statements Jesus is making here about the two types of fathers there are. The two types of fathers that there are. Um, either God the Father, which is in heaven, or God the who is the devil. And we've seen in John uh, 8, verses 31 and 32, Jesus offering discipleship and freedom to those believing in him. We go back real fast and read 31 and 32. This is what it says. Then said Jesus unto those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then, you will ye, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You know, Jesus said unto them who believed in him. The previous verse tells us that many believed on him. 
You know, Jesus spoke to those who had that beginning of belief, telling them what they needed to continue in belief, keep continue on believing. This section of the discourse is addressed to those who believe and yet do not believe. You know, there's the account where, you know, it was said, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. You know, there's people who believe but don't believe. Clearly, they were inclined to think that what Jesus said was true, but they were not prepared to yield him the far-reaching allegiance that real trust in him applies. This is the most dangerous spiritual state you can be in, where you believe but you're not willing to yield. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. If we will be Jesus' disciples, we must abide in his word. His word is the Bible. We must meditate on it, be in it. There is no other way. To be a follower of Jesus, the word made flesh is who Jesus is. Remember we've seen that in John chapter 1. The word made flesh is to abide in his word. That word abide means to live in, to dwell in, to make your home. We need to saturate ourselves with the word. If you abide in my word, to those who have uh, just been described as believing on him, Jesus went on to say, if you, emphasizing a distinction from those who had not believed. Abide in my word, not content with making the first step towards faith and obedience. Then, but not till then, are ye really my disciples. See, that's what if. That's a condition. That's the biggest little word in the Bible. If, on the condition that you abide in my work, live in it, make it your home, you are my disciples indeed. Uh, Tasker described what it means to abide in his word. This is what he said. Welcoming it, bringing at home with it, and living with it so continuously that it becomes part of the believer's life, a permanent influence and stimulus in the very fresh advance in goodness and holiness. So this too is another statement reflecting on the unity between the Father and the Son. Jesus called man to abide or live in his word. In the mouth of every other than Jesus, these words would be absurd. <laughs> Think if anyone else said this but Jesus. Our treatment of our Lord's word, uh, you know, it, it discriminates us. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them is he that loveth me. You know, how do we treat God's word? Do we keep his commandments? Do we follow them? If we don't, then we don't love him. You know, he that keepeth my commandments is he that loves me. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. This is the result of abiding in the word of Jesus. We prove ourselves to be his disciples, and we know the truth. And God works his freedom in our life through his truth. You see, you may say you're free, but if you're living in sin, you're in bondage to that sin. And God works his freedom in our life through his truth. The freedom Jesus spoke of doesn't come from just an academic pursuit pursuit of truth in general, but from abiding in his word and being his disciple. See, we have to live in it. That's how we pursue truth. There is nothing like the freedom we can have in Jesus. Money can't buy it. You know, no status can obtain it. No works can earn it and nothing can match it. It is tragic that not every Christian experiences this freedom which can never be found except by abiding in God's word and being Jesus' disciple. When you're in his word, you will be free indeed. You know, Jesus answers their protest that they are already free. They answer him, we are Abraham's descendants. We have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? 
Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say unto you, Whosoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son of son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. That's pretty much what he's saying there, and that's paraphrasing 33 through 36. We are Abraham's descendants, and we have never been in bondage to sin, is what they said. The reaction of the religious leaders wasn't, oh, that's wonderful news. Tell us more about what it means by trusting in you and being free. Instead, they re reacted this way. We don't need that. We're good. We got this. Have you ever said that in your life? Have you ever said you got something and ended up making it worse? That's normally what happens. This was a remarkable and unthinkable statement. Jewish people had been in bondage under Egypt and the Philistines under Babylon, Persia, Syria, and Rome. Was there not a Rome garrison looking down from the castle into the very temple courts where this boastful falsehood was uttered? Think about that. Yet many Jewish people of that time had a strong sense of their own independence. Josephus writes of the followers of Judah in Galilee who led a famous revolt against the Romans. They have an inevitable uh, attachment to liberty, and they say that God is to be their ruler and Lord. Now, the power of self-discipline is the un- converted man is impotent. The, the power of the self-deception in the unconverted man is infinite. That power never fades or goes away. Self-deception is powerful. And if we're not converted, it is infinite. Whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. In this passage, um, is a verb tense indicating a habitual, continual action. You know, that's what it's talking about. Whoever commits a sin is a slave to sin. That's a habitual, continual action. The person is habitual in sin is a slave to sin. The principle of construction, everyone who sins is in the present tense, which implies a continual habit of sinning rather than the occasional lapse. There is another kind of slavery, slavery other than social or economic slavery. Sin is a slave master. And it is possible even for people who think of themselves as free to be enslaved to sin. It is far too common for man never to have done some given evil, never to have gotten drunk, never to have stolen, or the like, than to have done it only once. You know, people say that all the time. I've only done it once. When I was a kid, I got into all kinds of stuff. And when I got caught, I would say it was my first time. And that was a lie. It's far more common for someone to not do it than someone to only do something once. We should not minimalize the force of bond serving. You know, it does not mean a person who is paid wages and who is a considerable area of freedom, it means a slave. You are a slave to sin. A slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Slavery to sin is the worst kind of slavery, because there is no escape from ourself. A son must set us free, and the Son of God sets us free and brings us into the household of God. The slave has no permanent footing in the house. He may be dismissed or sold. Think about that in that sense. But the son has that permanent foothold in the house. If the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. If we are set free from our slavery to sin, set free by the son and set free by abiding in Jesus's word and being his disciple, then we are free indeed. Having a true freedom that contrasts to the freedom the Pharisees blindly claimed. The son makes you free. So the slave of sin cannot by himself change his status. He cannot convert himself, nor can he be converted by any fellow sinner. Uh, the liberator from our bondage must come from outside the ranks 
of enslaved humanity. If we are slaves to sin, then we may be transferred from its household and bought into our true home in our Father's house. Here then is the blessed hope for us all. That hope is a confident expectation. It's what Jesus came to do for us. He came to die to set us free. You know, there's an 82-year-old Christian woman from Hong Kong um, who told her life story in China, but still used much of the vocabulary that the communists used in describing the revolution. They called it uh, uh, liberation. She was asked, when you were back in China, were you free to gather together with other Christians to worship? Oh, no, she answered. Since the uh, liberation, no one is permitted to gather together for Christian services. But surely you were able to get together in small groups and discuss the Christian faith. No, we were not, the woman replied. Since the liberation, all such meetings are forbidden. Were you free to read the Bible? Since the liberation, no one is free to read the Bible. So you see, they used the term liberated, but they weren't able to do these things because it wasn't true freedom. The point is clear. Freedom does not consist of the word freedom or in words, but in a relationship with Jesus Christ through abiding in his word and being his disciple. They proved themselves to be unlike their father Abraham as we get into it. You know, I read 37 through 41, and for the sake of time, we're going to skip reading it again and just highlight some things. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, Jesus tells them. Jesus would admit that they are Abraham's descendants in a genetic sense. But Abraham was not their father in a spiritual sense. When messengers from heaven came to Abraham, he received them. It, you can look that up in Genesis 18. But these genetic descendants of Abraham rejected and sought to kill the one sent from heaven. Uh, to cherish murderous intentions against someone who has imparted the truth of God to them is not the mark of the children of Abraham. Because my word has no place in you, Jesus says. Um, their rejection of the world, word of Jesus and Jesus the word prove that they were not like Abraham and that they did not have the freedom that comes from abiding in his word. Spurgeon considered several ways that God should have been a place in the believer. Here's some of them. The word of God ought to have an inward place. The word of God have to ha ought to have a place of high honor. The word of God ought to have a place of trust. The word of God ought to have a place of rule. The word of God ought to have a place of love. And the word of God ought to have a permanent place. So think about your life and how you view the word. Does it have that inward place? Is it in your heart? Is it a place of high honor? Do you make sure that's done before anything else? Is it a place to trust? Do you trust in the word? Do you know that the word of God is true? Is it a place of rule? The decisions you make in your life, is it biblically sound? Does it line up with the Bible? Is it a place of love? Do you feel love when you're reading the Bible? Do you? Does it help you to love others? And does it have a permanent place? Is it something that's never fleeting from you? That's how the Word of God should have a place in us. That's how it abides in us. I speak what I have seen with my Father. Jesus reminds them that what he did was consistent with the Father, and what they did was consistent with their Father, the Pharisees. You do what you have seen with your Father. Jesus would soon clearly tell them who their Father was. Abraham is our Father, they said. The religious leaders protested that Abraham was their true father. This was true in a genetic sense, but not in that spiritual sense. Jesus agreed they were descendants of Abraham, but not children of Abraham, because they sought to kill Jesus. When Abraham embraced him, they were doing the deeds of their father. You know, 
when I was young, I idolized my, my dad. I wanted to be just like my dad. My dad was a hard worker. He was a Marine. And, you know, as I grew up, I became a hard worker. Sometimes almost to a fault, but I give my all to my job. I work hard to provide for my family. I attempted to join the Marines. Unfortunately, I was saved and I wasn't living right. And there was a lot of mistakes that I made that prevented me from being able to join the Marines. I tried to and I tried to hide it. And when they found out, they wouldn't let me go. It was actually the day we were supposed to go and leave for basic training is when they found out and they wouldn't let me on the bus to go. It was probably the most humili humil hum humiliating thing up until that point in my life that I have ever done. And unfortunately, at that time, my father was a devil. And I couldn't see clearly, and I just got into more junk after that. See, Jesus exposed the inconsistencies in their life. They said they were children of Abraham, but didn't act like it at all. What about you? Who's your father? Is God your father or is Satan your father? What does your life reflect? If their origin could be wholly traced to Abraham, then their conduct would resemble his, in other words. But it doesn't. Jesus points out, or Jesus point, Jesus's points were important. Our spiritual Percentage is what determines our nature and our destiny. If we are born again and have God as our father, it will show our nature and destiny. But if your father is Satan, it will also show in our nature and destiny, just as it shows in these adversaries of Jesus. You see, these religious leaders were against Jesus, they were going against him. Had they really truly been Abraham's descendants in a spiritual sense. They would have embraced the teaching of Jesus. They would have embraced him because that's what Abraham did. Abraham had full trust in God. He had the trust and the ability to leave his father, his belongings, and everything. He left um, when God told him to, and he didn't even know where he was going. You know, God promised him that all nations would come from him and promised him a son. And when Isaac was born, you know, some years later when Isaac was a teenager, God told Abraham to sacrifice him. And Abraham willingly, immediately took part to sacrifice him. And we know the account that um, when they got everything said and done and it was about to happen, and Isaac, Isaac had trust too because he was a teenager. And the Bible tells us that Abraham bound him and put him on the altar. And he knew what the altar was about. And a teenage boy, and Abraham was an old man at this time, would have been able to fight himself. So he willingly laid down his life just as Christ did for us. But Abraham had that trust that if he sacrificed his son because God promised him this son, that he would raise him again from the dead. So as it was about to happen, you know, the angel called out to him and told him not to harm Isaac. And behold, there's a ram behind you stuck in a thicket. And God provided a sacrifice to take the place of Isaac. What a picture that is for us, that God sent his lamb his son, the perfect spotless lamb, to die on the cross for us, to take the sin of the entire world. So again, I want to ask you today, who's your father? Who are you serving? Is your true father the devil or is your true father God? If you're not a born again believer, if you haven't been born again, that needs to happen. You need to call out to him. Know and trust who he is. Reach out to someone who can help. If you are a believer, but your lifestyle isn't showing, 
that you are and you're in a bad place and you're still acting like your father, the devil. And in that sense, believers who are still having a life side of sin are acting like Jesus, God the Father, is their stepfather and not their true father. We need to separate ourselves from that junk. God can free us from that. Who the Son sets free, you are free indeed. Heavenly Father, we come to you this afternoon, Lord. We're thankful for the time that you've given us. Thank you for this lesson in your word. Thank you for showing us these things. Thank you for sending your Son. Help us to apply these things to our lives that we can live for you. Lord, be with us as we go throughout the rest of our day. Help us to keep our hearts and minds focused on you. Lord, I pray for the revival we're having tonight. And Brother Pat, who's going to be preaching, Lord, I, I pray that you help him to preach boldly, Lord, that uh, we don't see him. We only see the cross. Lord, meet with us at that meeting. Help us to understand and know that revival starts in our heart. It's not the meeting. It's not the preacher. It has to start with us. Lord, I ask that you continue to bless this Bible study. Thank you for what you're doing in in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining, guys. Uh, make sure you come back tomorrow morning and join as we finish out John chapter 8. Um, it, we should be ready to go and, and back on in the morning. Make sure you check out our the YouTube page, Lift and a Rift Ministries YouTube page, and Lift and a Rift Ministries um, website, which is posted on the webpage here and or the Facebook page here, go to that checkout. You can see what we're doing, um, our, our works, where we're, we're scheduled to preach and teach and things like that, pictures and updates, um, as well as links to the playlists. Um, make sure if you're not a follower here that you like and follow. Um, I'll appreciate it. Come back, join us tomorrow. Make sure you check out Blessed with Truth Ministries. My wife um, runs that, and she does a daily word of the day, and she has some other Bible studies on uh, First Peter and, and things like that. It will bless you. Make sure you check those things out, Lord, and uh, and and just you know keep on growing, keep on growing, and may you be blessed with truth today.